example, I'm down here in South Texas uh, with a group of men. We've got several sites where the guys are working. We're delivering beds. We got a group of women serving across the valley here. We're having a great time in the Colonias, sharing the love of Jesus. So thank you, church family, for helping make that happen. I'm excited today that Travis Cook is kicking off this new series. We're calling it Power, looking at the life of King David. You know, every uh, day, it seems, in the news, you hear of the abuse of power. We're asking the question, what does God-given power, you know, Holy Spirit power look like? Can we leverage the power that He gives us in order to, to bless others and advance His kingdom? Well, King David showed us that that is possible. But you know, he didn't do it perfectly. He had a lot of cracks in his own life that he paid for in big ways. So I, I want to just challenge you come every week as we walk through and learn how can we leverage all that God's given us in order to serve others. Today we talk about the power of calling, where it all begins. And so let's do this. Let's welcome Travis as he comes up to bring the Word of God and you receive it gladly as God speaks into your heart today. Thank you. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so I really like, yeah, that's really awkward and uncomfortable for me, so thank you. Um, I really like Jeff's kind of five o'clock chat we had going on there. I'd like to start like a Kickstarter and see if we can get Jeff to grow a beard. I think it'll look really great. Um, so no, this is a great new series we're starting. I'm really excited. I have never actually taught uh, on King David very much, and so this is exciting for me. I'm looking forward to being a part of it uh, in, a, in a small way. And uh, does anybody remember, does anybody get familiar with the term party line? Now, party line, not like the way we use it to talk about like a political party line, but like an actual party line. So back in the day, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, there were these things called landlines. And you would have a telephone actually connected physically to a line in the ground or in, in, the, in the, the power lines or whatever, and, and your phone would ring in your house and it wouldn't be in your pocket or like on a desk. It was, it was really strange, miraculous times we live in now. But if you wanted, like way back in the day when the phones first started, there was this thing called a party line. And if you wanted a cheaper, more discounted rate, you could actually share a phone line with other people in your neighborhood or on your street. And the way that you knew it was your phone ringing, so when the phone rang, it rang in everybody's house. So if your doctor was calling you to talk about that rash, everybody in your neighborhood could pick up the phone and hear about it. And it's a little awkward, you hear somebody breathing on the, you know, on the other end of the phone. And the way you knew it was your ring was that it would be distinct. So you might have two shorts and a long ring, and your neighbor would have two longs and a short. And it would just kind of go back and forth. And so imagine how difficult that would be. You're in your house, maybe you're working on something, and the phone starts ringing, and you're like, wait, wait was, was that ours? Was that two short? Was, was that one long? How, how does that? And you pick up the phone, and you're like, no, this is mine, this isn't mine. You pick up the phone to make a call, somebody's already using it. It's a very strange, uh, all to save a few cents, right? We, we, we do a lot of things. But I feel like God's calling can sometimes feel like we're on a party line. Like you're in this room, you're sitting here, and you're going you're gonna to hear the word of God open. You've heard from other pastors. You're going to hear from me. You're going to hear from Jeff later on. And you think, okay, how do I know that God is speaking to me and not somebody else? What's my ringtone for God? Like how do I know it's coming from him and not just a suggestion? How can I discern in my life the call of God? And if you've been in church long enough, that is a question you should have confronted. And if not, you need to confront it today because God is calling us to do things. There is power in calling. When I want to do something, that is different than feeling called because when I'm called, I feel compelled. I feel pushed to go do something by God. If I just want to do something, I'm fickle. A calling you almost can't deny, right? So it's important for me to know when God is calling me because there's power in it. There's a difference between having conviction in your calling and kind of being like, eh, maybe I'll do this, maybe I won't. There's power there. And the reason why we have that power is it comes from the one who calls us. So I want us to talk about how today we can discern the calling of God. Now, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 16. That's where we're going to spend our day today. And we're looking at the very first time we meet David. So this is our, our first date with King David. It'll be fun. And he is, is, is being called out by, by Samuel, which is really exciting. And I want us to look at, at a few different ways that God calls us and how we can kind of discern that calling. We don't have time to talk about everything today, but just a few things. So uh, 1 Samuel 16, 
Uh, The first thing we see is that God's call comes through other people. God's call comes through others. 1 Samuel is a book that's really structured around three callings. The first person that's called is Samuel. He's kind of a hybrid between a judge and a prophet. So he's the last judge of Israel. So if you've been walking through year of the Bible with us, you know the book of Judges. You had Samson and Ehud and all these other guys and gals, Deborah. And then Samuel's kind of the last in these line, this line of judges, and he's called by God. And he's called by God through an audible voice, but there's a a high priest named Eli who helps Samuel figure out that calling. Then Samuel anoints Saul to be king over Israel at the end of his, towards the end of his life. And he he anoints Saul and he says, you're going to be king over Israel. And Saul's not a great king, and we'll explain why in a bit. And then he goes and anoints David. And in every single one of these instances, Even if God is speaking directly to a person, there's actually another human being that comes along and affirms and makes that call clear, right? So God can call us through other people. Now, sometimes that's a direct calling where somebody comes to you and says, hey, I really feel like the Lord has laid on my heart that maybe you need to come and do this with me. And that's a direct calling. But sometimes it's it's more subtle than that. Sometimes God's call is, is, he uses other people indirectly. And I want to look at two of the ways that he does this that you see in the text here. The first one is through the failures of others. The failures of other people. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now, there's something not good in Israel, and it's the king. King Saul is not doing his job. Now, he's pretty good in some ways. He's actually a good military leader. He's fighting the Philistines, and he's winning some battles. He seems to be a pretty good governor because he's uniting the various tribes together, which sounds like, oh, he sounds like a good king, and in some ways he was. But he's a bad king in that his job, his primary job, is to represent God before the people and to represent the people before God. Not exactly like a priest, but he functions as sort of the leader. And as Saul goes, so goes the nation, right? And you see this throughout the kings. As the kings go, so goes the nation. So Saul has a really important job and he doesn't do this well. He doesn't represent the people well before God and he doesn't represent God well before the people. And so God says, enough is enough. Samuel Go and tell Saul, he's not, his dynasty is not going to survive. I'm not going to rule and reign through him anymore. Somebody else is going to take, the, take the, the place of Saul. And then Samuel goes, and then Samuel's grieving over this because Samuel anointed Saul. He wants Saul to do well. And God comes to him and says, stop grieving. We're moving on. Let's go call the next king of Israel. And that's what he's doing when he calls David. And so there are failures in our world. There are things that are not in line with the way that God wants to rule his world. It's very obvious if you turn on the news, you can see it very clearly. There's injustices, there, there, there's pain, there's hurt, there's, there's illnesses. There are things that we should be, as a church, eager to correct. And the reason why we're eager to do this is because that's exactly why Jesus came. Adam was supposed to rule and reign on God's behalf. And he fails by eating the fruit of the tree. So God sends his son into the world. He calls his son out into the world. The father calls the son to be obedient, to represent him perfectly and accurately, to be the best and most perfect human ever, and then to die for the sins of the people so that we might then be able to fill a calling to have a relationship with God and then go and advance the rule and reign of the kingdom of God. If Jesus Christ doesn't die on the cross, and if there is no resurrection, we have no calling. Calling doesn't make sense without the cross and without the empty tomb. Because there are failings, and the only cure for many, for all of the failings in our world, is to bear the gospel onto the problems in our society. It's going to look like a couple things. We mentioned social injustice. That's one of them. Social injustice is because people don't understand where they fit in the kingdom. And so they think they're the king rather than Jesus Christ is the king. You can also see it in your vocation, in your job. Your job is important. You spend most of your waking hours doing work. God has called you there. Now, we have some professions that are thought of really well, right? They kind of have this altruistic esteem to them. 
They're seen as generous in service industry. We think of doctors, nurses, teachers, maybe pastors, missionaries. Like we look at them and we think, wow, they're really like just sacrificing and serving people. And then we look at other professions. Sorry if I'm about to pick on you. Lawyers, <laughs> stock market traders, people that work in business. And we think to ourselves, well, they just seem to be in it for themselves. That's the stereotype, right? Like, I mean, how many lawyer jokes are there, right? What if God wants to use you, lawyer, use you, stock market guy, use you, marketer, to redeem and rescue your profession? Because here's what I believe. Somewhere along the way, you had predecessors in your profession who made it about them. Lawyers, lawyer, knowing the law is a good job. It's a good profession. Law is good. It helps us have an organized society. But somewhere along the way, there was a group, a, a generation perhaps, of lawyers who started making it all about them. And that's why we have this negative perception about lawyers. So what if you, in your profession, God has put you there to practice law, to rescue and redeem, and maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now, people will talk about the legal profession with the same esteem that we talk about doctors, nurses, and teachers. Because you and this generation has done something different. Your job is a calling. You're not a king. And if there is one in here, your highness, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're not a king. But you don't have to have a king, be a king or a queen to have a vocational calling. You are called to minister, to represent God to the people you work with and to represent the people you work with before God. So you're praying on their behalf. You're seeking their welfare. You're creating flourishing. Whether you are at the bottom of the ladder or at the very top, your job is to make God's name great in your workplace. That is your vocation, no matter what it is you do. And that's why your Monday is important. That's why you need to rest up and get ready because you have a mission field to go to and you're called to that because other people have failed. And it's your time through the power of the Holy Spirit to succeed. So we know we, we, we're called by the failings of others. We're also called by the successes and the obedience of others. Look at verse two. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you'll anoint me for me him whom I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice." Contrasted to the disobedience of Saul is the obedience of Samuel. Samuel's got a lot of reasons not to go to Bethlehem, to keep a low profile. One, he's just told the king of Israel, dude, this is it for you. Like, get your affairs in order. You're not going to have any sons reign on your throne. This is, your dynasty ends with you. That's a big problem, and that can put a target on your back. On top of that, Samuel is known as a kingmaker. So if he goes somewhere and he anoints somebody that has a lot of legitimacy and can create problems for him. And then when he decides to go, the people of Bethlehem come out and they're like, dude, hold up. Samuel, I don't know if you need to be here. Now, why are they a little worried about Samuel? It could be two things. One, they know he's a kingmaker and they know that him and Saul have had a falling out and they don't want to be considered abetting Samuel if there's a, an issue there. The other one is that Samuel's a prophet. And if you read the Old Testament, when prophets roll into town, they have this nasty habit of telling cities and places that God's going to punish them. And so Bethlehem's like, dude, before you even step in here, do you got good words for us or bad? And he's like, no, no, I'm, I'm here peacefully. It's fine. It's okay. So Samuel has all these reasons not to do what God is calling him to do, but he still does it. God can use the obedience of other people to call us into service for him. This is actually how I received my calling to be in ministry. I was at a uh, conference in Glorieta, New Mexico when I was in college. And uh, I went to one of their breakout sessions and there was an army chaplain speaking. And the army chaplain told a story of how he was able to, uh, through a tragedy, able to share the gospel with generals, military leaders from all sorts of different places all over the world. People from India, Pakistan, Egypt, all sorts of places. And I was sitting there and I was just mesmerized. And I was like, I want to do that. I don't know what I need to do to do that, but I want to do that. I want to proclaim the gospel 
two people in places of influence, and, 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 and I don't know that it was that mature, uh, but I knew I wanted to do that because of this chaplain's obedience. And you know what? I can't even tell you his name. You will see people in your world that are doing something, and you're like, I want to go do that. I want to join God in joining them, and I want to go and do that. That's why it's important for us to be surrounded by the body of believers. I am called to, to greater obedience and greater service and a greater affection for my God by being around you. And I hope you by being around me. We are called to things through the obedience of others. If you need to make a decision, maybe, maybe it's not ministry that you're being called into. I, I think that, that might be rare or, or uncommon. Maybe it's a job change. You're thinking, man, I, I want to change jobs. What do the godly people in your life say about that? Are they like, yeah, dude, do it? Or are they like, eh, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and you're thinking, I want to get married to this person. What do the godly people in your life say about marrying that person? Maybe you're thinking about ending. You're breaking up with, with somebody that you're dating. What do the godly people in your life say? Now, again, sometimes the godly people in your life might all be wrong, but that's really uncommon. That's rare. If nobody that follows Jesus Christ is going the same way you're going, that's not just one red flag. That's like six red flags over Georgia or over Texas, right? Sorry, I'm from Georgia. Six flags over Texas, right? It's a big deal, right? The obedience of other people is key in discerning our calling from God. We are called to address the failings of the past and of our current generation. That's one way we see our calling. But we also see it by following other people who are following Jesus. Paul says this, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, come on, follow, follow. We need to learn to follow. So even though we have people around us and we're able to kind of help discern our call that way, God's call can still seem unexpected. God's call can, is unexpected. And this can be unexpected in a lot of different ways, but I want to look at three of them. One is it has an unexpected look. It has an unexpected look. Look at verse six. When they came... He looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass by before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has chosen none of these. Samuel is going through the process. And you might think, wow, Samuel, I thought you said he was obedient. Here he is making a judgment call on appearances, right? Well, he's actually using common sense, which is a gifting that we have from God. The last king that he anointed, Saul, was tall, was good-looking, was the firstborn, and was from a wealthy family. So naturally, when the tall, good-looking firstborn walks in front of Samuel, he's like, this is the way God's worked before. Let's do this again. And it such, makes such sense that God has to speak in through an audible voice and be like, mm -mm, no, not this guy. Now, just because he rejects Eliab doesn't mean Eliab's this terrible person. It just means he's not fit to be a king. He's not the one that God has called. And sometimes our callings can have unexpected looks because God looks at the heart, not at the external circumstances. He looks at internal things. He looks at things we can't see. We're not omniscient. We don't know everything. And so God looks at all of these things and he calls people into his service. And that can look strange and unexpected sometimes. We are a visual people. We are a walk by sight people in our generation in this day and age. And it started with a TV. Uh, Kennedy Nixon debates. If you watch the debate on TV back in like, this is 1960, this isn't recent, sorry. Back in like 1960, if you watched the debate on TV, you thought Kennedy won. He was young, he was good looking, his makeup looked right. Kennedy won the debate. But if you heard it on the radio, everybody thought Richard Nixon won it. We're a visual people. And if it doesn't look right, smell right, taste right, we don't think it's right. But we're called to be a people. Second Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. You think about Jesus. Jesus doesn't look like a Messiah. He's a carpenter from like Podunk, Galilee. Come on. He doesn't look like a Messiah, but God looks at the heart. The thing that you might be called to 
might look unexpected. It might not look like you thought it might look. So it might have a different future for you than you thought. So one of the, one of the groups I think of, and this is probably because I work with them a lot, single adults. And maybe you thought you'd be married by now or have kids by now. And God's calling you to a different future. Now maybe he's calling you to a lifetime of celibacy. And I think that's something that we need to be willing to investigate. But here's what I do know. If you're not married, God is calling you to, to celibacy right now, at this time, right? And that might be different than what you thought. Your future can look different than what you thought it might. And that's okay. We need to trust God with that. Also, your life path may not look like everybody else's, right? We've talked about this before. We have a script, right, in our lives. We're born. We grow up a little bit. We go to school. We graduate. We go to college. We get a job. We get married. We have 2.5 children, and then we retire and die. And that's the script, everybody. There you go. But there's some of you, and I'm thinking of like my high school students who are graduating right now, They're coming up on graduation. And you're probably, hopefully, you've already applied to the schools you want to go to, but maybe God's calling you to something different. Maybe God wants you to take a break from school and go serve him somewhere. Gap year is kind of a cool idea. School's going to be there. Trust me, we're not getting rid of the university system. It'll be there. Explore that possibility. What does that look like for you? It might just follow an unexpected script from everybody else. That's okay. could also have an unexpected time. Look at verse 11, an unexpected time. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest. This can, this can also mean the smallest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, and I imagine he said this with like a, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. By the way, they were sitting down to eat, which is why I would be exasperated. I'd be like, really? Come on, I'm hungry. You could have an unexpected time. This is really inconvenient. They have to wait for David to get there so that they can sit down and eat and do all these things. He's out keeping the sheep, right? This is also inconvenient timing because I don't know if you know how monarchy works. I know we're like 200 and some odd years removed from our monarchy, but there typically is only one king at a time. And that position is already filled. Saul is filling that job. So this is an inconvenient time. Why are we anointing David now? Saul's still reigning. This is inconvenient timing. What, on top of this, David's really young. He could be as young as eight, maybe as old as 15. And what we know by reading David's story is it's going to be another 15 or 20 years before he takes the throne. This is inconvenient timing. It's unexpected timing. We just got a king. Why do we need a new one? God's timing can often be unexpected. In David's case, he was being called, he was being anointed, and then he had to wait for like 15 years. That's frustrating, I imagine. It takes time. You have to wait. Other times, we're, we're, we're told to drop everything and go serve God, right? You're like, man, I just got to drop everything and go. And if you're like me, how do, how do I know the difference? How do I know the difference between hurry up and how do I know the difference between wait? And if you're in the army, those are the same things. <laughs> you ever had a military career, you know what I'm talking about. How do I know the difference between hurrying up and waiting? Here's the difference. This is what I would say, not, this isn't necessarily from the Bible. This is just me talking. This is me, not the Lord. Do everything you can do to be faithful to the calling God has for you and then wait. So if God's maybe calling you, let's say, go back to school. You're like, well, now's not a great time. Like, I've got this thing going on. And then start investigating curriculum. Start investigating school. Start investigating. Take that first step and then take the next step and the next step and the next step. Maybe it'll get to the point where you need to drop everything, but maybe that's not right now. Maybe you just need to start looking into things, asking God to clarify, right? So we're going to have an unexpected look. And also have an unexpected hero. Look at verse 13 or verse 12. This is actually my life verse. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. <laughs> and the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. It's just the first part. That, that's the life verse. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon who? David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the first time we hear David's name. And we don't hear David's name until the spirit of God is mentioned. This tells you what's special about David. 
It's not who he is. It's not just that he has a heart, a heart after God's own heart. That, that's important, but not the most important thing. The most important thing about David's calling is not what he's called to do, and it's not who he is. It's who is calling him. That's where the power comes from. And what this spirit rushing upon him means is that everything David does from this point forward is going to work out right as he pursues this calling. And you see it in his life. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's going to be smooth. But it does mean that God is with him. Calling is important. And often our society tells us that we derive our calling from whatever I say about myself. So if I say I'm a good person, as long as I'm not Hitler, I'm in good shape. If I want to say I'm a Christian, great. As long as you go to church, cool. You can be a Christian. I can call myself whatever I want. If I want to call myself a female while I'm a male, I can do that because our society says your calling comes from in, within you. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your calling and your identity comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from him. What he says about you is the most important thing about you. So what does scripture say he says about us? Well, Romans 5, 9 says he, we're objects of wrath. Wait, what? Verse 10, God has called us his enemies. And Ephesians 2.1 says we're dead because of sin. Scripture also says, though, that we are children of God. Romans 8.1 says that we're free in Galatians 5.1, says we're reconciled in 5.11, and it says we're forgiven in Ephesians 1.7. How can we be both? How can we be simultaneously enemies of God and reconciled and adopted by him? How can we be both slaves to sin and free from sin? There's a transition that takes place. Every single person in this room has at some point been or is still an enemy of God because of sin and brokenness in your life. But for some of us who've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection and said, that's how I have a relationship with God. Through nothing else that I do, just through the cross of Christ, we've been transferred from that status into a new status, adopted child of God, loved, reconciled. And in that way, Jesus is the unexpected hero of our story. Who would have thought that a Jewish peasant from 2,000 years ago, who's also the son of God, would be my means to salvation? He's the unexpected hero of my story. And if he's not the hero of your story, he's not in your story at all. Jesus isn't winning awards for best supporting actor. He's either the lead or he's not in it at all. And this is important for us. He's the unexpected hero. And for some of you, you need to receive him into your life today. And then after we hear that unexpected call, God confirms his calling. He confirms his calling. This is a longer section. I'm going to read it, and while I'm reading it, I'm going to comment on it. Now, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So this is supposed to be read immediately after verse 13. The Spirit of God rushes upon David, and it departs from Saul. And a harmful spirit of the Lord tormented him. Now, you might think, wow, that's terrible, like God's tormenting Saul. Again, think about it through the lens of what's happening. David has the Spirit of God on him, so everything David does in pursuit of his calling is going to work out. Everything that Saul does is going to be opposed and confounded, and that's what's going on here. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you'll be well. So back in the day, they thought that uh, music chased away evil spirits. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David to his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So in the last passage we saw God chooses him, and this one Saul is choosing David. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. And so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed him. David's first step in chasing after his calling isn't to walk into the throne room of Saul and being like, you're in my seat and that's my hat. That's not his first step. What's his first step? His first step, one, is to wait. And all of a sudden somebody shows up and is like, hey, we need you to play the lyre 
before the king. So now David is in Saul's presence. Now this is really helpful. Think practically. David now spends a bunch of time in a royal court learning by proxy how to rule and run a kingdom. God is using this small step and David takes more and more responsibility. However, God is using this in a very practical way for David. He's sitting there playing. He's like, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, that's what you're not supposed to do. Okay, cool. And he's playing his lyre. He's playing his harp. That's what a lyre is. It's a harp. The first step isn't to just jump. It's to wait and to listen. And and I think that as as God works in our lives, as God calls you to something, he's going to confirm that calling along the way. So what are ways that we can seek out the, the confirmation of God in our calling? Well, I think there's a few things here. One, prayer and the word. I feel like this should go without saying. But the word of God is like God's telephone. The Bible is like God's telephone, and it rings for you every day. Every day. And many of us don't bother picking it up. And we wonder what God wants us to do with our life. If you don't know, it might be because you're not reading his word and you're not spending time prayerfully considering it. I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon last week, and it was a prayer before he would read scripture. He basically said, Oh, living Christ, make your word alive to me. It's a great prayer, short, brief, to pray right before you get into scripture. Another one is other people affirm your calling. This makes sense, right? We talked about this a little bit. But there's people that know David and they're like, hey, we know a guy who can fix this for you. We know a guy who can do this. And they come and affirm David and what he's doing, right? There should be other godly people, like I said, who are affirming you in your calling. And if they're not, that's a red flag. Listening to other people in in helping discern your call is kind of like flying a plane. There's a lot of things you have to keep track of, altitude, um, attitude, you got to keep pitch and roll and other words that I looked up on the internet <laughs> about flying a plane. But like, that's one. Hearing other people's voices is one way that you learn what God wants for you and, and whether that confirms that calling or not. Another one is to look for means and opportunity. There's a means and opportunity. So David has a gifting, right? Plays a harp. And he's got time on his hands, so he goes and does this. I think about this from last week. Um, Joseph of Arimathea. There's a need, right? There's a need that that Jesus has. He needs a tomb because he's died. And Joseph says, I've got one. I'm not using it. There's a need, and there's an opportunity. And praise God, Jesus didn't need it very long. There's needs and opportunity. You can look for those needs and opportunity and then look at what skill set you have. So so maybe there's a need for for millions of dollars. I can't meet that need. I do not have the opportunity to do so. But there might be somebody that does. Maybe there's a need for service here at the church. And maybe somebody's like, that's not my thing. But somebody else will be like, no, I I can do that. We look for needs. We look for opportunity. Also, your calling should be satisfying and fulfilling. David goes to play the lyre. Do you know why David played the lyre for Saul? Because he practiced playing the lyre. Do you know what the, why people practice? Probably because they enjoy it. The reason why I don't play guitar is because I didn't enjoy it and I didn't practice. The last thing we have that David speaks in 2 Samuel 22 is a psalm that he writes. David wrote a lot of the psalms. He loves music. And he gets to use something that he loves and gets to to deploy it for the glory of God. This has been helpful for me in my calling. So I like teaching. I enjoy teaching. I like opening up scriptures, talking about theology, talking about doctrine, talking about how other people can follow Jesus. I love that stuff. And there are other parts of my job that I don't like. I told this to Jeff this morning, but this is confessional. I don't really like staff meeting. (laughs) I love my, my coworkers. I just don't like meetings. But what I've learned as I've encountered things in my work that I don't enjoy as much as some other things is that they are either opportunities to teach or opportunities to learn. And so I look at everything I do through that lens. Is this an opportunity to teach or is it an opportunity to learn? And I go from there. If I ever get to the point and think, I need a room this big with this many people in it to use my gifting, it's not my gifting and it's not my call anymore because it's about me. Your gifting, your calling is about playing whatever instrument God has given you for his glory and for the good of other people. So play your harp, 
play your lyre. If you're a drummer, play your drums. And I'm speaking metaphorically. You have something that you can do. Use it. Don't sit on it and certainly don't use it for your own benefit. It is for others and it is for the glory of God. And if you don't know what it might be, there's ways that you can learn what it is. And the last way that we confirm our calling, and this is going to seem strange, is through baptism. Through baptism, you're like, what? That doesn't make sense. It does, if you understand what baptism is. Baptism is the opportunity for your church body to come around you and talk to you about your faith. So what I hope is today, maybe there's somebody in this room that's not baptized. You believe in Christ. Maybe you don't know if you believe in Christ. You don't know what you're supposed to believe, but you've never been baptized. And you think, I need to be baptized. I want to be baptized. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to the next steps room. I want you to talk to me. And I'm going to ask you questions about what you believe. It's not going to be intimidating. It's not going to be confrontational. At least I hope not. And I want to help you nail down what it is you believe about Jesus. And then I want the church to come around you and affirm you in your belief. Get that sorted out and nailed down. And that's what baptism is. It's an opportunity for you to proclaim the gospel that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And it's an opportunity for the church to be like, yes, he's one of us. Baptism. Some of you need to be baptized. And you're struggling with your relationship with God because you haven't done that. It doesn't save you. No. But man, it certainly helps to be able to look back on this time and be like, I remember what I believed then and I still believe it now. And if I might also add, you are around a lot of people every day who have problems like King Saul had problems. They are tormented by something like depression, loss, misery, grief. Maybe they're tormented by pride and success and they don't realize it. And you're sitting there in, their, in their, their circle of friends and you're being like, I know a guy. And you don't say anything. And the guy you know is Jesus Christ. I know a guy that can help you with that. I know the guy that can chase away that problem for you and help you fight it. We just talked about how the Lion of Judah fights our battles. And that's for everybody. It's not just for us. And we need to share that with other people. You are called to do that in your profession, in your families both those you live with and those who are extended. That is your calling. We know our calling because we derive it from Jesus Christ who was also called. He was the one who was sent and so we are sent as well because the tomb is empty, the grave, death has been defeated and your phone is ringing. Your phone is ringing and is God saying, as we read from Isaiah this week, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And your calling today is to pick up that phone and say, here I am, send me. And it's scary. And it's a big ask. But God will not leave you. He will not abandon you. He didn't leave David. He didn't leave his son. And he will not leave you. Let's pray. Gracious God, You are good to us because you have called us. You have given our lives purpose and meaning. And that purpose and meaning is to give you glory and worship and to serve others and to shine your light, to give your gospel into dark places that don't know you, whether they're people we work with, whether people that are in our family, whatever it might be, to share the truth of your love that's manifested in the cross of Christ. And so God, I pray that you would speak to us through others. Help us to write the failings of the past through your gospel. Help us to be obedient that others may be called. And when your call is unexpected, may we take a moment to maybe be caught off guard, but then may we follow. Lord, I pray that our lives would be defined by a cross and an empty tomb. And may it motivate us, may it give us power in our calling, not because of what you called us to and because of who we are but because who you are and what you've done. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.